I feel like I should just have the slide up here and say, okay, that's all you need to know, folks, and we can go out. But, um, but I really appreciate, I appreciate that. And it's also interesting talking about campaign finance in the same tone, you know, the same words with Aristotle and Plato, because I, I, was, reading, um, I was reading the George Washington book just now by Ron Chernow, and um, it talked about George Washington in the early campaigns, and he ran for the House of Burgess in the 1750s and wasn't elected. And at that time, uh, campaigns, you weren't allowed to campaign for yourself. You had to get surrogates. So in 1758, he decided to run again, and he got surrogates to go out and beat the band for him, and he was elected to the House of Burgesses. After the election, he was presented with a campaign finance bill from his surrogates. And it was a campaign finance bill in the amount of 39 pounds. He was quite shocked. And the money went, to be, the money went for buying uh, wine, cider, beer, and rum to intoxicate voters to go and vote for him, <laughs> which was totally illegal. So, which is a way of saying that campaign finance has been part of the fabric of the United States since it's, you know, before its founding, as well as ways to avoid and evade the rules. So, if you think of campaign finance and you think of rule breaking, it goes all the way back to George Washington. Um, what we're going to do today is I'm going to give you like a little history of campaign finance, a little, just walk through history, and then just kind of explain all the different terms because if you don't cover campaign finance, you'll see that there's you know, all kinds of rules and regulations and it gets very complicated and very fuzzy. But if you have any sort of comfort level with numbers, it's a very simple kind of follow the money sort of story. Um, you know, a lot of political reporters, a lot of political reporters are afraid of campaign finance because they'll see a number and they'll run in the other direction or they really like covering policy and personalities and, and being on the campaign trail. This is a different type of campaign coverage. And it's a campaign coverage that I think is, you know, it's, I find it a really fascinating type of campaign coverage. I really enjoy it. I've gotten terrific stories out of it. And it's a way that you can define a niche that's different than everybody else on the campaign trail. And from a practical level, um, if you've ever been out on, on a campaign trail, you'll find that it's completely grueling. You're up in the morning, you're on these buses, you're you know, in cars running around Iowa doing all these things. Um, you know, campaign finance is a little different. You're really having to focus. You, you do get personalities, you do get people, you do get out there um, doing interviews in different places, but it's a slightly different kind of, and I find um, personally a much more gratifying kind of reporting. Um, I also say if you have any questions, and just interrupt. If there's something you don't understand, just raise your hand. So um, this is a little campaign finance humor. I hope you find it. I hope you find it humorous. And uh, milestones in campaign finance. We sort of. I just want you to understand a little bit of the context of of campaign finance, where we got the rules that we have today. As I said, we go all the way back. Am I moving around too much for you? Okay. Uh, we, all, we go all the way back to, to George Washington. But more recently, more recently, the sort of current era of campaign finance and campaign finance reform began in, with the Watergate scandals in, 1970, in the early 1970s. If any of you were around, you may remember that um, you know, there were these slush funds, there were, you know, there were, um, you know, it was, it, there were like, uh, safes with cash in it that was being used by the, the, the committee, to re, re, committee to reelect the president. Um, the hush money that the burglars used um, was campaign finance money. It was CREEP, was the campaign to reelect the president. The, the cash was taken out of the accounts of CREEP and paid to the burglars that then burgled the Democratic National, uh, the Democratic National offices in the Watergate. In the wake of that scandal, and in the wake of the resignation of, of President Nixon, the FEC, the FEC is the Federal Election Commission. The Federal Election Commission is the regulatory body that oversees the campaign finance rules. The problem right now with the FEC is that the FEC was structured in a way that it has three Republicans and three Democrats. So if you can imagine three Republicans and three Democrats 
What do you think is going on at the FEC right now? Nothing. 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 That there's been a lot of rulemaking proposed, and um, they're very, every so often there will be some bipartisan consensus within the FEC, and there'll be sort of you know, times when they try to make changes. Um, but at the moment, it's stalemated. Surprise, surprise. But also, that's when the spending limits were enacted. Um, when you give money to a campaign, and we'll go into the numbers, when you give money to a campaign, there are limits on how much money you can give. These are hard dollars. How much you can give to a candidate, to a party, to a political action committee. Those spending limits were enacted. Um, between sort of, and then, okay, so then between sort of like 19, in the mid-1970s to 2002 was the era of soft money. That's when you had large amounts of money that were coming into the political parties, unregulated money. And there was a lot of discussion about the soft money. You may remember all that discussion. Um, with, and there were the Lincoln bedroom visits, if you remember in the Clinton White House where the donors were given access to the Lincoln bedroom. Um, that ended in 2002 with the McCain-Feingold Act, which eliminated soft money. Um, so that was a big reform, and some of you may remember that. Maybe yes, maybe no. Um, from 2007 onward, after the, after the uh, McCain-Feingold Act was enacted, then everybody tried to come up with loopholes. And of course, the loophole game started. And pretty soon, uh, everything that was in the McCain-Feingold Act was kind of undermined by all different kinds of small regulations and loopholes that allowed issue ads, the advent of the 527s, different forms of, which are basically the same as soft money, to grow. But um, the, the big, big, big thing that happened, and you've heard about this, the big thing that happened was in 2010, the case, how many of you have heard of Citizens United? How many of you know what Citizens United does? Tell me what it does. Tell, tell you, tell me what it does. So basically, it. Um, I should not put the slide here. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try not to look at it. Yeah. It basically gives uh, corporations and interest groups the same rights as individuals and, and eliminates the, the limits on how much you can donate. In a way, in a way, in a way, all these things. Anything else? It doesn't have to Campaign donation, who said that? Oh, back there. Campaign donations, that's, the, that's been the tension between campaign finance regulation and free speech all along. I mean, not only Citizens United, but it, it predated Citizens United. It's between you know, free speech versus the corrupting influence of, of money. And that's the sort of balance that the courts have been, uh, the courts have been uh, dealing with. Sort of, it, it, technically, what Citizens United does is that historically, Corporations and unions could participate in political campaigns through political action committees. They could not take money out of the union treasury. They could not take money out of the corporate treasury to engage in politics in any manner whatsoever. You could set up a Microsoft PAC, a GM PAC, a uh, Google PAC, name your company, in which, or the union, the Teamsters PAC, or the AFL-CIO PAC in which members or employees would donate to that PAC, and that PAC would then give, to the, to give directly to the candidates. The difference with, um, but they were not allowed to take money out of the union treasury or out of the corporate treasury and, and, um, and, par and engage in politics. The difference is that under Citizens United, corporations and unions can spend unlimited amounts uh, of money from their treasury to vote for independent ads. They do not necessarily give directly to candidates. They can't coordinate with candidates. They can't give to candidates. They can only do these issue ads. And before, they could only give, I mean, the corporations didn't give, but corporations had PACs, yeah. You know, it's an interesting thing that's coming up because there was a proposal uh, before the SEC that's actually current before the SEC. Uh, the SEC, not the FEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, saying that this is shareholders' money and therefore it should be disclosed in the financials of you know, what the money went, went for. And it's under consideration by the SEC right now, but I think, but right now nothing is happening on that. 
<laughs> and again, it gets engaged in politics. That, um, but, the, but the thought is, is that corporations should disclose this to shareholders because the shareholders may support it or not. So you know, they, they just should know. But anyway, so that's what it was, was that there was a change in way that corporations and unions could engage in politics. And, it, and I have a, a, that's a dam breaking, <laughs> is it what it looks like? I don't know, maybe that's not a great, good, great dam. But that, I mean, if you thought there was like big money in campaigns, um, it's even bigger money in campaigns. And so it increased the influence of big money. Um, it opened up this, air, this whole thing of super PACs, which began the super PACs, which are also called independent expenditures, began in like 2010. And, um, and it came as a result of Citizens United. So does everybody, yeah? What's the difference between a PAC and a super PAC? Difference between a PAC and a super PAC, we'll get into that. Um, but I'll say it right now and then we can get into it a little bit later. A PAC, Political Action Committee, um, takes money in, in limited amounts. Like there's a limited amount that you can give to, your PAC, to a PAC. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of rules about the money that can go into a political action committee. The money that goes into political action committee is fully disclosed in the FEC filings. So if you give money to, where, where are you, who are you with? Seattle Times. Okay, if the, um, let's, say, let's say you'd work for Microsoft mm -hmm. and you gave money to the Microsoft PAC, your name would be in the FEC filings. Everybody would know that and there's a limitation on how much you can give to that PAC. But that PAC can make direct donations to candidates. So that PAC can give money to, um, you know, can give money to Ted Cruz, it can give money to Hillary Clinton, that PAC can give money to whomever it wants. A super PAC is a different animal. And a super PAC does, cannot give directly to candidates. It can only engage in what's called independent expenditures, issue ads. So you would give money to your super PAC. So you give money to your super PAC, and the super PAC does not, cannot coordinate with the campaign, and it just puts up ads that say, Hillary is great, Ted Cruz is wonderful, Hillary is terrible, Ted Cruz is terrible. And do they still have to disclose? The, right, the rules, and I have a little chart on this, but the rules get a little fuzzy under what circumstances, and what circumstances uh, super PACs disclose. And there's ways that they can route money through nonprofits that then it gets very complicated. Um, but if you understand the terminology, that's the thing, it gets complicated, but if you understand the terminology and some of the context, you can ask the questions. And you can begin to see, you know, ask a question of, you know, where's this money coming from, what it's, so you, you, you have a better, like, context of it. Um, What's the, the difference between uh, campaign finance and political crowdfunding? Campaign finance and political? Crowdfunding. Political crowdfunding. I'm not even aware of political crowdfunding. I don't even think it takes place here. Do you mean like people coming together and putting things together? Yeah. No. Typically, if you're supporting a candidate, you would write a check to that candidate. So you would say, okay, I'm going to write somebody's running for Congress, somebody's running for president, somebody's running for dog catcher. I'm going to write a, a check to that particular campaign. So you typically, as a person, would give it to that campaign or you could give it to any number of other organizations that engage in politics, like a political action committee, a party committee, you know, a super PAC. Does that mean, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Is this where you were going? No, yeah. Okay. Yeah. How does it work if you buy a ticket to a fundraising event, like a dinner or something like that? That's that a campaign reported. contribution, and so that gets reported. reported, yeah. Because you'll have a, uh, I'll just pick on Ted Cruz again, because he's on top of brain. Ted Cruz for president. Um, you know, there'll be a fundraiser in Des Moines. $500 ticket for the Ted Cruz for president at, at, in Des Moines. You get a nice dinner at 801, and you get five, you know, $500 gets you know, contributed to the Ted Cruz campaign, or to any number of other groups that might be raising money. Um, Citizens United. They, uh, why? If we have Obama's picture up there because this is what um, Obama said when the Citizens United decision took place. Um, that it was, and, and it's actually true. I mean, it's turned out to be a major victory for all these moneyed interests. And the reason why, just right. like the reason why we have 
Hillary Clinton's picture up there. Does anybody know why we have Hillary Clinton's picture up there? She was the topic of the movie without us. She was a topic of, yes, exactly. Citizens United was a conservative group that ran a very nasty anti-Hillary movie. And, um, and, and that was the sort of the case turned on the Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. The Federal Election Commission was opposing what Citizens United did. The Supreme Court upheld, upheld it. So that's why Hillary Clinton's picture is there. What's a political fund like? Like when people are funders or funders, is that same thing as like a PAC? Um, I'll get into that in just a little bit, but I'll tell you right now. Okay. It's, when, <laughs> it's, when, it's when he goes to the, uh, the fundraise, the guy who's putting together that fundraiser for Ted Cruz, and he says, okay, I maxed out. I've given all that I can directly to the Ted Cruz campaign. So I'm going to get all my buddies to give to the Ted Cruz campaign. I'm going to bundle up all their checks, and I'm going to give them to the campaign. And as a result of that, you get credit for it. So like, if you remember like the George Bush campaign where there were the Rangers and the Pioneers and all these people at these different levels, um, they were, a lot of them were bundlers because they couldn't give to the campaign. You know, you could only give $2,700 to campaign, which is what we'll get into. Um, so once you're maxed out, you get all your buddies. And then you become, it gives you status within the campaign so that now you're in good stand with Ted Cruz or Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders or whomever. Yeah? Maybe this is too much detail, but what precedent was the Supreme Court relying on for Citizens United? There had been another, uh, a, a lim there's been a number of campaign finance cases like Buckley v. Vallejo, there's a bunch of them. But it, it really came down to free speech. It was really, uh, it was really political expression as protected as a guaranteed as free speech, and they saw this as a an expression of free speech. The other side said it's the corrupting influence of money. So those are the two, you know, the, the, that's sort of what it turned on. It was a five to four decision. Okay, hard money is best. Hard money, hard money is money that goes directly to a political campaign, and hard money is what. Um, you know, it's, it's the best money for the campaign because the campaign has control over it itself. The campaign can do what it wants with this money. This is money that goes to pollsters and, and advertising and yard signs and consultants and all that. But so when you write your check and you write your check to Ted Cruz for president or Hillary Clinton for president or Bernie for president or, or um, you know, Jeb Bush for president, um, these are the limitations, but you are limited in the amount that you can give in hard dollars. So if you're an, uh, a, um, if you're, you know, you're a real uh, Bernie Sanders supporter, for instance, $2,700 you can give to Bernie in the primary. If Bernie becomes the candidate, 27 to him. You can give 27 to Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz becomes the nominee. You can give him another, another 27. Um, you can also give money to a national political party committee. Do, there are, the national political parties, uh, um, These are the national political party committees that you can give money to. The RNC or the DNC, RNC, Republican National Committee, Democratic National Committee, you give them money and they will spend it on the presidential race. The senatorial campaigns committees, the National Republican Sen Senate Committee, the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee, you give a check to those committees and they will use it to elect Democratic or Republican members of the Senate. Same thing for, the, for Congress, the Congressional Committees, the National Republican Congressional Committee, the DCCC, you write a check to them, they will use it on behalf of, um, you know, on behalf of getting members of Congress elected. You can also give $5,000 to a PAC. So this can be your Microsoft PAC, it can be your, um, if you work for Disney, your Disney PAC, your whomever PAC. And the PAC itself then can give directly to the candidates but it's limited. This is how much the PACs can give to each candidate. They can give to, again, the 10,000 if it's person makes it to the nominee. Um, they can also give money to other PACs. You can have PAC to PAC giving. So 
um, a lot of candidates have things called leadership packs. So most members of Congress, especially if they're a powerful member of the Senate or of the, of the House, they will have a leadership pack. And why would somebody, and then the leadership pack gives out money to candidates. Why would, it, why would somebody who's a sitting member of Congress have a leadership pack? Yeah, basically within your party. Arm twisting. Yeah, it's basically that if you're, um, you know, you're an incumbent senator from Arizona, and you're not up for re-election, but you're still, people are still writing you checks. You want to make sure that you get other Republicans elected, and you know that there's a contested race, a contested Senate race over there in New Mexico, or a contested Senate race somewhere else. Your leadership pack can go to put money into that race to get that Republican elected, or anybody else who, if you're a Republican, who you want to support, you know, getting, you know, you want to give them some, some support. So that's what a leadership pack is. I'm backing up a second. Yeah, sure. RNC, NRSC, are those each considered like a separate political party? They're each considered separate political committees. These are all like, you know, this is all part of the Republican Party and this is all part of the Democratic Party. But you've heard of the, the DNC and the RNC. You're probably familiar with that. But there's all the, these other campaign committees that are dedicated to Senate candidates and to congressional candidates. And all these limitations, when it talks about national party committees, that's what, that's what they're talking about, money that goes to these committees. So there's a lot of venues where you can give money directly. Um, any other questions on? Hard money, okay. Yes, no, or you just. Hard money, go away. Okay. Um, anyway, so now it gets in. This is. So hard money is the easy part, okay? Um, the harder part is this the dark money. The dark money that's coming into the campaign, the bigger and darker money. And. Um, you know, there's a whole variety of different ways that these guys, that you can get money into a campaign to influence a campaign outside of giving money to a candidate. And each one has different, different rules and different regulations. We've talked about super PACs. So people really feel like you kind of have a grasp of super PACs. Super PACs are independent expenditure, pools of independent expenditures. They came into being in 2010. And they, um, you know, they can't give money directly to the candidates, but they can, they can put in ads on their behalf. Um, 527s. 527s came into being in, um, the, uh, in, the, in the, like, 2007, 2008. And these are called issue groups. Um, it's a ta they're tax exempt under the IRS rules. And they can raise unlimited amounts of money from corporations, from unions, and from individuals to be used for issue ads. And there are some, for, for the 527s and for the super PACs, there are some rules requiring disclosure, but it's all over the map. So it's hard to say hard and fast that they have to, the names have to be disclosed or that they don't. It's all a little, it sort of it, it's under, it depends. Yeah. Yeah. They are 501c3s that you're familiar with with your Salvation Army. Yes. And they're allowed to do political? And they can do, yes. There are 501c3s, 501c4s, 501c5s, and 501c6s. There's a bunch of different categories. And, um, and they can engage in politics. Yes. And that's the, that's the darkest part of the dark money. Yes. I have two questions. Yeah. One is there a central resource for journalists to look all these up? Mm -hmm. Two, which we'll get in, we'll get at the end. How has Citizens United or any other loophole um, allowed for the influence of international money, particularly say terrorists who want to influence the presidential race? Um, if a terrorist is a U.S. citizen or is a green card holder, the terrorist can, you know write a check like anybody else. You know, maybe under occupation you write in terrorist. I don't know because when you 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 
when you, you know, contribute, you have to disclose your address and your occupation. Typically, you do. But could but the super PAC accept money? There could be, yeah, yes. But uh, let, let me just get you what the rules are first. What the rules are, only U.S. citizens and green card holders can contribute to a, a campaign. All that stuff, all, all these kinds of things, you can only have U.S. citizens and green card holders. Um, you know, because I remember there were like Norm Shu, there were these, every so often the scandals about, you know, Chinese money coming into the campaign. There was a big sort of Chinese money scandal with, in the, and when Clinton was running for president. Um, yeah, I guess in theory, you could have, if these things are secretive and there's very little disclosure, you could have a bunch of guys who are sitting around as terrorists saying, hey, we want to get, name your candidate, we want to support Jeb Bush, okay? We think Hillary is really terrific. So we're going to sit here in our little terrorist cell and send money to the whatever. Could it happen? It could happen. I'm not saying it can't happen. But it couldn't have happened before it could have happened before. It could have happened before 2010 in some ways because the five because the 527s were be getting to um, come in. You probably could have come in with some, you know, but it would have to be really, really complicated, and uh, the chances are probably less. But um, but under these nonprofits, you might be able to. But I don't know. It actually would be an interesting. That's an interesting question for somebody who's like deeper into campaign finance than I'm. That I am, you know, somebody who like like really lives this stuff every day. But, but just so you know, non-citizens can't donate. And, and not only can non-citizens can't donate, like I was in uh, the 08 election. Yeah, 08 election. I was in doing a story about the overseas, overseas supporters, you know, American expats living overseas. So I was in doing about London. So um, in London, there was a big uh, Obama uh, activity and there's big, Repu uh, re big Republican activity, and and uh, the like a lot of the Brits who were supporting Obama, they were having like Obama fundraisers in London, and they're saying like a lot of their British friends were coming there and saying, hey, can we help sort? You know, we want Obama to be elected. Can we help? You know, we'll man the table, we'll hand out the things, we'll put up the posters, and you could not do that because that's considered an in-kind campaign contribution. So they had to tell all their nice British friends. We, no, no, you can come, but you can't do anything. <laughs> Just don't put up a sign. Don't do anything. Um, because it would be an illegal, be considered an illegal campaign contribution. Was there a hand up? Yeah. So is this the mechanism to say the Koch brothers use when, you know, they say they're going to raise almost a billion dollars? Yeah, I mean, Koch brothers do uh, a whole variety, they have a whole variety of different ways of getting money into the election. Plus, they have their own um, just nonprofit organizations that don't engage in partisan politics, but are policy, you know, policy discussion groups that typically have a libertarian and a conservative bent. You know, they always have that annual meeting, some, I can't remember where it is now. So they engage in politics in a variety of ways of, you know, funding some of these groups and then having groups that aren't necessarily engaged in partisan politics, but in policy discussions. But anyway, the 50C3s, um, are nonprofits, um, and they can under the uh, under the IRS code, and they can engage in a certain amount of political activity, depending on the political activity, as long as it's not the main thing that they do. Um, and then that gets kind of fuzzy because, um, uh, like, like the five hundred one c threes are charitable and religious organizations, and they they can't do politicking, but they can do voter registration and a certain amount of stuff. Uh, 501c4s are social welfare, um, and they can uh, engage in a certain amount of politics as long as it's not their primary thing. 501c5s are labor and agriculture. 501c6s are business and chambers of commerce. Um, but the point is, is that um, you know what you have to do is just be familiar with these terms, and I'll have I've got a handout on it. Be familiar with these terms so that you have kind of a general understanding, and you always have to ask somebody because it's very slippery. Why did you say that the 501Cs were disclosure? Because there's very little disclo there's little disclosure about who's giving money into the 501C3s. There's more just the, the the in in levels of disclosure, like the hard money. When you give money to a campaign, it's reported to the FEC. 
anybody can go on the FEC website and see that you gave that. You give money to a PAC, a regular political action committee, that's totally disclosed. The PAC's giving money to each other, that's totally disclosed. It, as you move further away, there's less and less disclosure. And there's very little disclosure with the 501c3s. So it's kind of on a spectrum. And, and you can give more money to 501c3 because there's, you can give in unlimited amounts. So I've got a little um, video here um, about They can't give money directly to candidates. They can put out, they can put out ads and all that. And, and the amount that they can take in is unlimited amounts. So, oh, it's going to start over again, thanks. Inevitably, ah. in a battle between 62 tons ah. of armor and a hatchback, there's... There, okay, thank you. Oh, <laughs> uh, we're now, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'm going to give this out. I'm going to just going to show you this. Um, I'm going to give this out to you. Do the 501 c fours? Wait, 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 wait. Disclose how much money they're spending. Wait, just a sec. Hold on, just a second. I just want to get this um, full screen. What happened to the full screen? There we go. Okay, your question is. Do they have to disclose somewhere for the amount of money that they're spending, or the that's totally secret. Which, which ones? The fours, the fives, and the sixes. No, they don't have to disclose. Um, there's been attempts to try to get the IRS to, um, you know, to have, um, you know, to get them to disclose, but um, it's gone nowhere. So I'll, I'm going to hand, give this to you as a handout um, about, you know, and you'll see sort of the different, the different groups. This group, which is called Independent Expenditures, this came into being in 2010. This was like the Karl Rove American Crossroads. Um, there's, but they, at, at this thing which came out in 2010 was calling them independent expenditures. But today we call them super PACs. So it's basically, basically a super PAC. And, um, and as you see, as you go down the spec, on the, on the columns, there's more disclosure on the left-hand side and less disclosure and more money on the right-hand side. I mean, the flip side for a candidate is what they're, what, I mean, there's two things on these independent expenditures. One, they found in like the 2012 election that like the people who are running a lot of the, the, the independent, like the American Crossroads, were a lot of the same people who are also working on the Bush, on the uh, Romney campaign. And same thing on the Democratic side, that, you know, they're supposed to be independent. They can't talk to the candidates. They can't disclose what they're doing. They have to do independent. When you have those disclaimers under McCain-Feingold, you have to have that disclaimer, and you'll have the disclaimer, it'll say like, I, I'm so-and-so and I endorse this ad, or this ad brought to you by American Crossroads, so you know where it came from. But a lot of times, the, the line between the campaign and the independent expenditure group, or the super PAC, is very, very thin. If you've got the same people, or friends, or like-minded people running it. The flip side for the candidate, though, and Ted Cruz has actually come out talking about how, on some level, you're grateful for this, but on the other hand, you can't control the message. These independent groups can say whatever they want to say. If it's your campaign money, it's your message. So those are, that's kind of the yin and yang of, of it. Um, Let's say the like the Phoenix Chamber of Commerce wants Ted Cruz to win. They don't have to say this ad was paid for by the Phoenix Chamber of Commerce? It does have to be disclosed. Yeah, under McCain-Feingold, it has to be disclosed. Okay. Now, they can have a, they can have a name that it doesn't necessarily say Phoenix Chamber of Commerce because they can create a group called Citizens for Better Government. You know, and so you see a lot of those ads like Citizens for Better Government. How do they enforce? Like, if I wrote like Hillary a five thousand dollar check, would I immediately get like whatever the difference back, or like does it the difference back from whom? Like, because you can only donate up to 20 oh twenty seven. Yes, they'll get they'll refund the so money back. The campaign or the would campaign, no, no, the camp, the campaign, no, the campaign would give you the money. The campaign would send a check back. Okay. They, they do not want to have anybody break. Campaigns do not want to have anybody uh, breaking the limits. So that they would take the twenty-seven and they would send the, the rest back. But right now, you can give twenty-seven to candidate to, you know, Cruz, Rubio, 
Jeb Bush, Bernie Sanders, you can give 27 to their, to their primary race, and then once they're nominated, you can give them another 27. So where are campaigns getting enough money to travel and pay their staff and do all of those things? It doesn't mostly come from individuals? From doing... the campaign themselves, the campaign yeah. itself, it comes from individuals and PACs. Individuals and PACs. So a PAC are, are there tons of PACs? Because they can only get there are tons of PACs. Yes, there's okay. tons. There's tons of PACs. So you have something like the Microsoft PAC. The Microsoft PAC, it's limited, but but the hard money is what the campaign really cares about, because the hard money is what you can use under your own control. It's nice to have all these other groups helping you. That's really really nice, and candidates are increasingly dependent on that. But they, you know, they really can't coordinate. Although it's sort of they kind of, you know, you know what? If you had to do, if you had to do an independent ad for Ted Cruz, if you had to do an independent ad for Bernie Sanders, you'd probably know what to say. But in the same hand, the candidates can't and the campaigns can't control those ads. They can't control where they're placed, what they say, anything about them. But how's that enforced? How's that enforced? How do you mean? How's it enforced? Well, he's smarter than that. He is smarter than that. He would not. He would not do that because you could end up with an FEC enforcement, and you don't want that. It's not worth it. It's like who, you know, who's to know? Like, how would they know? How would they know? Somebody could. Somebody within the campaign could could ran them out. We had a, uh, dark money. They are looking at their texts between each other now. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. The people knocking on doors and doing the stuff traditionally done by campaigns. Yeah, well, she hasn't. Because she doesn't have a lot of. She doesn't. Well, she hasn't. She hasn't directed them to do that. The, the, there was a big story in the Times, which was just like a couple of days ago, about how the super PACs and the independent expenditures typically had been, um, you know, like about ads. They had really done a lot of the TV ads, and then all the ground stuff was done by the campaigns. But increasingly, the super PACs are doing basically all that groundwork that they're putting out the, the signs, they're doing the get out the vote, they're knocking on doors, they're doing all the, the ground stuff. But she can't direct them to do that. She can be grateful that they're doing that. She can be say nice things about them, but she can't call them up and say, hey, why don't you do this for me? That would be illegal. Yeah. In-kind donation to a campaign is counted the same as a dollar. Okay. So if you're doing Volunteer time, volunteer time is different. There's, there's kind of there's rules about what constitutes an in-kind donation. Um, if you're a volunteer, that's not an in-kind donation. That's just a volunteer. Then why couldn't the British people help put up signs? I mean, that would be volunteer time. They couldn't. They, they could. I, all I know is I was over there and, and I was talking to the Obama people, and I also talked to the Republicans, and both said the same thing that they couldn't. They couldn't man a table. They could. They just couldn't do it. They didn't. They, or maybe. Maybe it's a gray area and they didn't want to risk it, but they definitely, definitely uh, wouldn't allow them to do anything. So if I owned a business, I could get like $2,700 myself, but then also have the business donate some type of service. You could have, you could have $2,700. Um, a corporation, you, I think the corporation would have to give to an independent, the corporation would have to give to an independent expenditure, it would have to be as an independent expenditure, you as an individual can write a check to the campaign. Okay, um, so we got those image pages and I'm going to hand out that that page, I've got a bunch of things. Okay, so we've gone over what bundlers are. Bundlers, it's a way of, of getting influence. Um, PACs, we've talked about PACs, we've talked about super PACs, and we've talked about leadership PACs. Okay. Are bundlers unlimited? Is it, isn't that essentially the same thing as a PAC? If you no, because it's like you, because it's your hard money, his hard money, her hard money, you know, Sally's hard money, Joe's hard money, Bob's hard money. That you would have like a, you've got a nice house, you have a big fundraiser at your house. You got a big house in Dallas, okay? You have a big fundraiser there. Everybody writes a check for the maximum amount to the party, to the this, to the that. You bundle it up. You are the the guy. You're the bag man. You're the bag man. You're the bag man. Yeah. Yeah, it's you and all your rich friends. 
basically. And then that guy, Mr. Ethanol, of course, you know, he can pick up the phone and talk to somebody on the Christie campaign because now he's Mr. Big Shot because he just routed up all this money for, for Christie. Did you have a question or no? Okay. Um, we talked about party committees. These are the don't you can give to a party committee. Public matching funds, very interesting. Public matching funds. Until the 2000 election when Obama did not take public matching funds, in the presidential race, in the presidential race, you know on your income tax, where you had that little check off, you know, the check off for the, the presidential campaign fund. Up to that point, um, each candidate, once they were the party's candidate, once there was after the political convention and you were now the Democratic or the Republican nominee, you stopped raising money, you stopped raising hard money, and you got a chunk of money from the U.S. government, from the dollar checkoff, for, from the taxpayers, to run your campaign. And currently the, pres the amount is $88 million. Um, what happened in 2008, 2008 was the first year that uh, a presidential candidate refused to take the the matching funds. It's called the matching funds. Refused, and that was Obama. And when you take the matching funds, you're limited to spending only the amount of those matching funds. You can't raise any more hard money, and it has to be sprinkled around the United States. You can't just put all the money into battleground states. So in 08, Obama declined to take the matching funds and instead continued to fundraise, and he way, way, way out fundraised John McCain. And McCain stuck with the money. And of course, McCain's, McCain's campaign was hobbled by lack of money. Um, so, so the public, so, and then since 2008, no presidential candidate has taken the public matching money. So that system, which was a kind of a reform system, has gone kaput as well. Um, I want to kind of get through this. Uh, 2012, the most expensive country. That's how much money went into federal races. Um, and this, of course, in this campaign, most likely these records are going to be broken. Um, here are just, this was, th this was from the uh, Center for Responsive Politics. Um, and this was like sort of the contributions of who are the big givers in contributions. Um, and I think what we see is where's the, uh, Finance, finance, insurance, and real estate, big, other is big. Um, lawyers and lobbyists, the dark purple, big givers. Um, it's a little hard to see. Ideological, you know, a lot of PACs are also ideological PACs. You could have an NRA PAC, you can have an Emily's List PAC, you could have, you know, it's not only corporate PACs. So these are, this is how it breaks down in terms of who's giving, um, who's been giving to campaigns. Um, in the 2012 presidential race, the candidates, this is how much money was spent in the 2012 presidential race. And this was the first billion dollar campaign. Um, and you can see the, when it talks about candidates, that's how much money was raised in hard dollars. Um, how much money was given to the party. That's basically the RNC or the DNC to, that's going to spend on behalf of the candidates. Um, outside money. And what do we see taking place in, in this? What does this tell us about fundraising, uh, fundraising patterns from the different parties? The dark money has a bigger influence that's growing. Yeah. And Republicans, and Republicans yeah. Yeah, the outside money, that, that hard money and individual checks are, um, you know, it's sort of like disproportionately to the, to the Democrats, to Obama, and the outside money disproportionately to Romney. Now, on the other hand, and Romney outraised, combined, outraised uh, Obama, but we know the outcome, so, yeah. How's the outside money influence on like, you know, smaller elections, state and local? Is that kind of a, following a similar pattern to this, or? You know, each state, that's why I don't, I don't I'm going to give you a website for state and local elections, but every state has different things, and I'm, I deal with like the federal elections, so in terms of like what happens in a gubernatorial race in Arizona versus a Senate race, well, a Senate race is federal, but versus a gubernatorial one somewhere else, I don't know. I don't know. You'd have to go, you know, state by state. 
Yeah. Your point about the totals at the bottom and the, and the outcome of the 2012 presidential race uh, you know, prompts a question of everyone spends a ton of time, rightly so, looking into the mechanics of this stuff. Yeah. What I don't hear discussed nearly as often is the, how much does this matter? What is, it, what, what is the effect? And, and I, outside of a couple of you know, economic studies I think I've read yeah. regarding you know, kinds of issues that Congress takes up versus the kinds of things that people are, are really care about. Really care about. The, 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 the level of inquiry and study and reporting <laughs> uh, seems to just basically be, be built around a, an assumption that you know, money, is, m money, money equals influence and, 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 and it's generally you know, bad. But not you're saying you're saying because not necessarily because of this, but the but where it where the flip of that would be if you look at Congress, you look at a lot of legislation in Congress and you say, well, polling in the United States, you know, X number the you know, majority of people believe this, but yet Congress won't do it because of the money. So I think a lot of times a lot of the you know the relationship between money, power, and outcome in legislation takes place in Congress. There's no question. I, yeah. I, just, I just think that. In contrast with the granular level mm -hmm. with which everyone looks at this stuff, yeah. I don't think I don't get the sense that, that people are, are, are you know, probing with, with that much detail. You know what's likely to matter. So, so a story about you know ex congressional race says Joe Smith has raised uh, uh, you know a million and Sam Jones has mm -hmm. raised two million. Okay, so what? What, is, what is the next set? Next, next, next step is decision? from home, and that means that. Joe Smith has a, has, a, has a better chance of beating Sam Jones or vice versa, or what are these, what, what, well, what, what you the, have what to do is, history indicated? yeah, well, what you'd have to do then is peel back who's giving the money. Yeah, you know, if and, you look. And, well, and, and then what, what is, how do you connect who's giving it to the kind of policies or the, the, way, the way they vote in the, in the Exactly. But, that, but, that's, a but that's, other, that's a whole other re level of reporting. And then there's all these, you know, there's all these websites about lobbyists and lobbyist donations. And, and you know, if you look at like a, Chuck Schumer in New York. You know, where's Chuck Schumer getting all his, you know, where is he getting his money? Well, we don't see Chuck Schumer who gets a huge amount of money from the financial services industry. We don't see him saying, oh boy, let's pass Dodd-Frank. You know, I mean, you, know, you can see, I mean, you can't see a direct correlation, like a check comes in and a vote goes out, but you can see how money and, it's either like, my, money goes to like-minded candidates or the candidates respond to that. and. You know, it's. Right. There's limited data on this stuff. Yeah. It'd be nice to see more data. Yeah. Like no. Just yeah. Um, outside money. So this is 2016, um, and here is the money that the different candidates currently have in in 2016, and we see that Jeb Bush is got a lot of money. So to your point about you know money and outcome, it's not helping him. It's not helping him. No, it's not helping him at all. Um, Ted Cruz, they just had some quarterly numbers, so these numbers are like a couple months out of date. Because uh, I just saw a story where Ted Cruz got $20 million, and I think it was in hard donations. So the bottom money is the hard money, and the top money is the soft money, or the outside, outside stuff. So you see how Jeb Bush is doing um, well in the money race, and not so well in the polling race. So money doesn't always necessarily, but you know, but it seems like we'll the see. Soft money is a pretty accurate barometer of how, how you're doing. If you look at soft money, I mean, Hillary Clinton's the front runner. Yeah. Ben Carson was the front runner up until about two weeks ago. Yeah. Bernie Sanders is number two in the Democratic Party. And the same thing with the 2012 election. Like, if you look at the soft money, it's almost reflected the soft money. Wait. Our top number. Wait, wait, you're talking about. Wait, just a second. Oh, no, no, it's the other way around. I mean, sorry. You know what I mean? Hard, sorry. Yeah. Hard money's on I, the bottom. Right? Hard money's on the bottom. Yeah, the candidate money, mean, yeah, Clinton yeah. Is by far. Well, hard money is where the voters put their checks. Right. Hard money is where the voters put their checks. Although it's voters who are also who are, you know, writing checks to outside committees too. But, but you're talking about you're talking about the rank and file voter. Rank and file voters. Yeah, rank and file voters. Because you see Bernie Sanders, you know, his donations are primarily rank and file voters and very little outside money for Bernie. Um, you know, Jeb Bush, you know, it was the Republican establishment that he can tap into and that saw him as the candidate early on and poured the money in. Um, and then, so uh, does anybody want to look at that a little longer? 
No? Okay. And then we've got Donald Trump, who has no money from outside groups, and then he's got the candidate money, and the candidate money is, a lot of it is his own money. You are allowed to put unlimited amounts of your own money, it's called the millionaire's exemption, um, in your own campaign, and he doesn't have any outside groups. And of course, he's kind of operating in a whole different set of rules, breaking rules, and sort of upending a lot of political wisdom. Um, so far in the 2016 election, here's what we see. Um, we see the uh, super PACs, we see the C4s, the C6s, the C5s, we see the party committees. Um, this is the outside money that's come into the campaigns so far. Why it doesn't track with um, others, it, the numbers don't always track. So just have to, this is also, all these numbers are from uh, Open Secrets, Center for Responsive Politics. Um, these are for the issue ads, and this also isn't uh, fully disclosed. There's other money floating around as well. This is the best that they, um, that they have from, from, this, from the ones that actually report. Um, super PACs, uh, here's what's spent and raised so far. Um, these are different super PACs uh, supporting different candidates, and that's how much they spent so far on the left-hand column. And on the right-hand column is how much they've raised. So raised and spent, two different things. Um, Club, for Ac Club for Growth Action Committee. Club for Growth is a long-standing um, libertarian conservative group. Um, and it doesn't necessarily support any individual candidate. Are there any liberal super PACs? There are liberal super PACs, yeah. They, they, um, you'd have to go further down in the field. <laughs> you know, I just took the, you know, took the top ones off because there are super PACs that are supporting um, the Clinton candidacy. How have some of them spent more than they've raised? Um, how that works, I don't know. Maybe they're in debt. You know, they could be in debt. I mean, you know, when a candidate, when the election is over, it doesn't mean that the bills, you know, the, the classic one was Senator John Glenn. He was like paying off campaign debts for like years and years and years. Um, and and I think what we're, seeing, what we're seeing in this particular race and post Citizens United is really the power of big money, you know, and maybe this will change, but right now the power of big money, and one of the stories in the Times I thought was interesting was uh, families, that, um, that groups of families have contributed, these, these groups of families, 158 families have contributed over half of the money in the presidential race, the majority supporting Republicans. Um, and, um, and this gets into sort of bundling, because it wasn't just, you know, because each member of the family, so here's the families, both the, the rich families, 138 rich families supporting Republicans and Democrats, 20. Um, I want to get into what to do in stories, you know, sort of story ideas. And then I want to get into, in the remaining time, so we have to end at noon for the lunch. And I guess you have to have your photo taken. Um, what to look for in stories and then where to get information on, on candidates and where do you find this data. So these are a couple ideas that I have in terms of giving and spending. But I think that what you want to do is you want to look for stories on two ends. The first end is who's giving to the campaigns? Who are these people? What's their motivation? What kind of money are they giving? Are they giving 501c3s? You know, what is it? The other part is you want to go, where is the money being spent? Who's spending this money? And in the packet that you'll get at the end, um, I'm giving you a couple things. One is, this is going to be the, um, that sheet with, you know, kind of the crib sheet. Um, then this is something, money in politics. It's kind of a, a, a whole bunch of links that a friend of mine, Jim Grimaldi, who works for the uh, Wall Street Journal, put together that I took at a conference, and then some on how to follow state and local races. But then the next two kind of get into, one is the political consultant racket, just an interesting story, how much. And then there's the last one was a story that I had done um, from the 2008 race. And basically this story was about how John Edwards was using nonprofit organizations to prop up his <coughs> candidacy in a very kind of shaky way when before he was running for president. 
And I found out about it by just looking up the 990s of some nonprofits that he was associated in, and I found out that he was on sort of finding, looking in, he was running an anti poverty campaign. And the anti poverty campaign that he discovered was in Iowa and New Hampshire and South Carolina. You know, so, and that's where all the money from his nonprofit was going. So you'll get these. But in terms of stories, what kind of stories to look for? And then we'll look at like uh, giving um, patterns. You know, you want to look for where are the, where's the money coming from, from industries, from regions, from issue groups, you know, who, who, what, what clusters, clusters of things. Um, outliers and oddities, you know, is something not hanging, is something not hanging together? Is there some unusual transfer of funds? Um, I had done one story a million years ago about Alphonse D'Amato when some money that was coming into him from Florida was being routed through here, through there. And then I called up some of the donors, and it turns out the money ended up in George Pataki's campaign. And the donors thought they were donating to Alphonse D'Amato, and the money ended up in George Pataki. It was completely goofy. But if you start looking for outliers and oddities, um, big donors versus small donors. Who are the people who are, who are um, giving? What's the motivation? What are some of the names? Bundlers, we've talked about bundlers, who are these folks? Um, you want to look at federal, state, and local races, you know, the whole enchilada. Uh, new techniques, colorful events, any lavish excess. Lavish excess and color is always good in fundraising. Um, and you want to check the periodic reports. Every uh, couple months, there's reports that come out about the, the rate, the, how much money has been raised by the candidate. So you want that. Spending. Um, air war versus ground war. Air war is the media campaign, ground war is the get out the vote, uh, polling, all that kind of stuff. Who's getting rich? The consultants, the ad buyers, the pollsters, who are these folks? What states, which states are economically benefiting from this? Um, you know, who's, where, where are they spending the money? And when they spend the money, what does that indicate about their campaign strategy? Big data, there's a lot of data that's collected. Um, and now there's also a lot of demographic data that's being used by campaigns to slice and dice. You know, they'll send out one piece of literature to soccer moms and a different type of literature to football dads. And how do they determine who's a soccer mom and who's a football dad? They have huge banks of, of demographic data on people. Um, the conventions, the inaugurations, more money, that's another source of fundraising and fund spending. Um, and the burn rate, burn rate. How quickly are these, how quickly are these, um, are they going through the money? You know, McCain went, got into a lot of trouble because his burn rate was really, really high. And by the time I think it was New Hampshire, he was practically out of money. And, and um, anyway, so sources. Um, here are a couple, so these are a bunch of sources. Um, so the granddaddy of them all, the big comprehensive one, is the Center for Responsive Politics. How many of you have used their website? OK. Cannot locate internet server. Why, where is, ugh. OK, let's try the FEC. I actually like the FEC website. Um, the FEC website has a, um, here is the disclosure portal. Trying to think. Oop. I don't know how to get it bigger. Um, upper left green dot. Upper left green dot. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, here, um, you go into that. They have this campaign finance disclosure. Each one of these websites, whether it's Open Secrets, which I want, I'll try to open up somehow otherwise, and the FEC, are um, they have people there that will help you. You know, it's like Steve Doig was saying, just call them up. You know, there are people in there that really want to, you know, provide information for you. But you have a, a like, searchable. So you have the candidate. I was doing this the other night. Like, if you look at, like, Schumer, my senator, Chuck Schumer. Um, okay, so here we find what Chuck Schumer has raised. 
And we see that Chuck Schumer, who's not running for re-election, has this committee, Friends of Schumer. Um, we see that he is in this particular time period, which was from 1-1 to, in 2015, he's raised $9 million and he has spent only a million dollars. And Chuck Schumer has, how much does Chuck Schumer have in terms of cash on hand? 22 million, yeah. So does Chuck Schumer have a good war chest going there? Yeah. Um, can he, and I think he does have a leadership pack, uh, friends of Schumer. Now also what you can do is you can individualize campaign contributions. So here's all the different people who have given to him, and you see the amounts. But what's also interesting, and I find from, useful from a reporter's standpoint, is if you're doing a story, you know how you always need warm bodies, you need voices in a story. Well, here, if you want to just click on anybody, click on this guy from Great Neck, you'll get his, um, you'll get the, the receipt. And what's nice is that you get, I mean, there it, just, there it also says the firm that he's working for, so you can locate this guy at the firm, but it also has his address. So if you have a person's address, you can more easily locate them and you can call them up. And you know, if you're working on stories and you need people, this is a good source, yeah. How do you typically know what, what is within the range of reasonable for a candidate to have? Because I imagine it really varies by race and by gender. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Because you know, running, for, you know, running for Senate in California, running for Senate in New York, is going to be a lot more expensive than running for Senate in Wyoming. So what you do is, yeah, and, and you, look at, you look at patterns. You look at the spending of candidate A. You look at, you know, if there's a race going on, look at, you know, who's, who's, who's spending more money and who, who isn't. Um, how do I get off this page? Ah! Um, you, um, you know, you just, you know, because every race is going to be different. Um, I, want, I had pulled up on the other one. I wanted to show you Barbara Streisand. Uh, oh, then, then also the report summaries. There's all these kinds of things, but this is this is the FEC data. Um, why? You had J.J. Abrams on the previous page too, the Star Wars director. Oh, really? Yeah. Let's it's, see. This is Jeff Abrams of Bad Robot. That's his company. Oh, really? Yeah, right below. The let me let me pull it back up. I'm just trying to get this back up. So I, I could have just <laughs> let's see, Friends of Schumer. Uh, let's see, individual. Jeffrey, Jeffrey yeah, Jeffrey, Abrams, Bad Robot, and Sino. Uh, yeah, that's the director of Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> there he is, Sweet 900 of Encino, California. There we go, Eagle Eye. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, and they have, you know, they have hot topics, they have super PACs, you know, there's, there's a lot of, I would basically say, familiarize yourself with the FEC website. Um, another website that's... Hit the escape button, and then we'll... Thank you. And then I could just hit that, okay. Um, I'm going to try that open, that, you know, we were having a problem with the open secrets one earlier, okay. Sunlight Foundation. Uh, this is another nonprofit in Washington that tracks uh, campaign finance stuff. What's sort of interesting on them is they have one interesting tool that I particularly like. It's kind of fun. Um, they have a thing called party time. So if you want to know, you know, if there's like a fundraisers, you know, for your stories, you want to get fundraisers, you want to kind of, you know, check out the invitations, all the lavish excess, that's where you find it under party time. And they have a, um, they, they really do keep here all the fundraisers. So we know that um, if you want to go to Marco Rubio fundraiser in Texas to get some color or any of these, you can see who's doing, who's doing what. Are, can, are candidates required to announce fundraisers? Even Not necessarily, no. These are, this is like, I think, a volunteer effort. Um, yeah. Is there any way to track bundlers? I mean, does no one pick you to report any? Um, open secrets, open secrets, which doesn't open. 
Open Secrets does a certain amount of that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, for question. What's the stop of bundler from basically, I guess, I don't know if the right word would be, but let's say like you throw a giant fundraiser where everybody gets lobster, champagne, and whatever else, and then they, they give their donations. Like, is it just a way to kind of mask you basically giving them? Wait, wait, say your question again. What's to stop them from basically masking that they're giving them money? Like? Uh, it, you can't, or you have, it's illegal to uh, give a count. It's like like your family, like it's illegal to give a, your money to somebody else and then they write the check. And, so and, and, and candidates have gotten into trouble that way. But if I throw your party lavish enough, basically you're just paying for the stuff I'm giving. You know what I mean? Like I'm basically, let's say I have a million dollars. I throw you a million dollar party and I invite all my friends. Yeah, but those friends are writing checks for $2,700 and you're eating that million dollar party. Yeah, but it's basically me giving the money, isn't it? No, it's it's no no no. It's not it's not considered the fundraiser is not considered in kind contribution. No, it's just you're just you're just throwing a lavish party, but it's not an in kind contribution. It seems odd. Yeah, that may. I'm just tell, I'm just tell, I'm just I'm just saying. Well, the campaign can't use that lobster. Once the lobster is eaten, it's gone. Do you see what I'm saying? Is the party is ephemeral, but the twenty-seven hundred dollars is twenty-seven hundred dollars they can use. Okay. It's yeah. Anyway, the last okay then. But you know. But also, I'm, I'm just going to say. I'm just going to say that a lot of this stuff is gets really complicated. So what you need is you need to find out. You need to find attorneys who specialize in this stuff, and then ask them the questions. This is the other one, which is the money in state politics. Um, and this, this collects money uh, in state, you know, sort of money from state races, gubernatorial races, Senate race, lo uh, local legislative races. Um, let me hand out, you've, already, uh, you've got one of these. I'm okay. okay, so um, actually I'm gonna just hand this back here. Take it, go half, 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 half. And I'm going to try real quickly just to pull up the um, Open Secrets, which. Just type OpenSecrets.org in the address. Yeah. OK. And then we're going to go and get our picture taken. No? Well, you just knew. I just knew because I overheard you guys. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, uh, right, right after this, we're going to get the group photo. We're going to do it down in the forum so everybody, we figured it's much easier to get you than after you eat because you disperse. Uh, so we're going to be doing it, but then we have to keep on schedule because we've got four editors down here for the next session. So okay. Head down to the forum right after. Yeah. Okay. So this is, this is it. So here's Barbara Streisand. Um, here's who she's given this year, money to candidates, money to, um, you can sort by all election cycles, start another search. Anyway, does anybody have any other questions, or we are? Uh, I just have that one question. Is there a list of all the super tax packs, like the central database? Um, if you go, if you go on the, um, if you go on the uh, Open Secrets website, they have a lot of data. I don't know if they have all, but they've got a whole bunch. Anyway, okay, so. I leave, I leave you guys with Barbara Streisand. Okay, last question, then we go, yeah. Don't the religious bodies also give money in the cost of campaigns? Yeah. Legislative bodies do not no, give money to religious, religious bodies. Religious bodies, yeah. religious bodies yeah. if it's through a political action committee, if it's through a political act, I think they typically, religion, religious groups would fall under a 501c3 or 501c4. I can't remember which one. 
you would have to call some expert and ask them that. Um, I'm not aware of like, let's say like the Catholic Church having a PAC or the Episcopalian Church having a PAC. Um, it, I just don't know. I don't know. I mean, I don't see them active in, you don't, I've never come across like a Catholic PAC or, a, or you know, whatever, you know, different PACs. Now, like-minded people, like a whole bunch of Catholics, might come together and support a candidate who thinks like them. Or but evangelicals not a, but might... But not as a body. But not as a body, like the Catholic Church of America, boom, that I'm aware of. I've never seen it. Okay? Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you.